بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها النبي إن أرسلناك شاهدا ومبشرا ومبشرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا صدق الله العظيم we begin by praising Allah Azza wa Jalla and seeking Allah's blessings upon Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions and all of the believers. Uh, respected brothers and sisters, inshallah, today we'll be beginning or restarting our seerah class. And we've had a long break. And the importance of seerah is such that even if we have a short break, we have to return to it. So we're returning, alhamdulillah. And we're going to continue from where we had left off previously. Over the past couple of years, we had studied the period before Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's birth, the history of the Arabs, the reasons why we study seerah, and we continued throughout the uh, beginning stages of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life, his birth, the circumstances surrounding his birth, and then the events that occurred immediately after birth, nursing period, period of infancy and, and, and a tod uh, being a toddler and the loss of his mother, his grandfather, um, custodianship and guardianship of Abu Talib, his life as a youth, all of these different subjects we've covered right up until Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's prophethood. And after prophethood, we covered the first few years which resulted in da'wah and calling people to Allah in secrecy after which there was the public call to Islam, followed by persecution, followed by migration to Habasha, Abyssinia, followed by different events that occurred, such as the boycotts, Muqata'a of Banu Hashim. There, was, there were other incidences like Ta'if. There was the Hijra, uh, sorry, the, the Isra and Mi'raj, uh, the loss of Khadija radiallahu anha and Abu Talib. And then, of course, Isra and Mi'raj happening afterwards. Then we learn about the Hijrah. So we studied Bay'atul Aqaba Til Ula, Athaniyah, the pledges of Aqaba that occurred. If anybody wants to recap and follow this or, or, or um, listen to these again, you can go to the ISB YouTube channel and under To Know Him is To Love Him, you'll find all 58 episodes so far, inshallah. So we're going to be continuing from that period onwards where Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is finally almost arriving in Medina Munawwara and before he arrives in Medina Munawwara he stops at Quba and he stop, stops at the uh, area of Banu Amr bin Auf so this is the part of the story that we arrived at and there were some really interesting things that occurred during that time also with Buraida al, uh, Buraida al Aslami becoming Muslim Sahal bin Hunayf and the story of Sahal bin Hunayf few things now we're going to speak about Suhaib al-Rumi because it's during Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's stay in Quba that Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu anhu arrives now Suhaib al-Rumi is, is in Mecca but he wasn't able to make the hijrah yet and there's certain things that happen that stops him from uh, migrating but first who is Suhaib al-Rumi and why is he significant so Suhaib ibn Sinan al-Rumi was not really Persian, uh, not really Roman or Byzantine, even though he's named a Rumi. And I'm going to explain why he was named a Rumi. He actually belongs to an Arab family, but his family were assigned the duty to uh, take care of a palace that belonged to the Persians. So it's a Persian town that his father was living in, and that town is in present day Basra in Iraq today. His father was Arab but he was the custodian of this palace on behalf of the uh, Persian Empire. He had a few children, one of them was Suhaib, and he was a beautiful young boy. The family went out for a picnic one day, and the Byzantines attacked. And when they attacked the area, they kidnapped many people. Among them was Suhaib, who was later to be known as Suhaib al-Rumi. So Suhaib is captured as a young boy, and he's taken to what is known as Istanbul today, present day Istanbul, because that was the capital of the uh, Byzantine Empire. So he arrives there and he is turned from one palace to another, from one master to another. 
serving in the courts, serving in the palaces. And what that does to him is gives him the opportunity to see the life of the elite, which he starts to detest and he dislikes. And he's looking for any opportunity to escape. And being of Arab descent and a son of the desert, as they call him, he wanted to go back to his roots. So he, ha- he made his intention for Makkah Mukarramah. He arrives in Makkah Mukarramah and he takes oath with Abdullah bin Jada'an. So Abdullah bin Jada'an gave him a man, gave him security, became an ally of his, which was a custom. Somebody moves into your city, they have to have an alliance within that city to give them protection. So he enters Makkah Mukarramah under the protection and the hilf of Abdullah bin Jada'an. He lives in Mecca for a while and he earns a lot of money. He becomes quite wealthy. He starts to do business and trade and he starts earning. One time he leaves the town and when he returns to Mecca, he hears about Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa calling people towards Allah. He hears about the call to Tawheed and La ilaha illallah. So immediately he asks, where is Muhammad right now? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So he's told that Muhammad Peace be upon him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Is in the house of Arqam Ibn Abil Arqam This is where the Muslims used to gather The, the house of Arqam Ibn Abil Arqam So, they got, so he, he makes his way there When he reaches there He sees somebody else at the door Ammar bin Yasir Radiallahu anhu And he starts to wonder he, You know because There's negativity Towards Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and hostility He doesn't want to be known To have gone to visit Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam So he's disguising himself a little bit And he's asking Then he re- he's asks Ammar Ammar what are you doing here? And Ammar says what are you doing here? And he says I've come to hear What Rasulullah Muhammad Peace be upon him has to say We've heard him speak about Allah or We've heard that he's speaking about Tawheed Calling people to the oneness of Allah and to give up idolatry and shirk I've come to listen to his message Ammar says I've come for the same reason So they knock on the door And they enter They enter and they inform Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Why they are visiting Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Starts to call them to Allah And gives them more da'wah They spend the entire day With Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And they leave at night Now they leave at night then it becomes commonly known that Suhaib al-Rumi has become Muslim. Now Suhaib al-Rumi, even though he was Arab of descent, he was of Arab descent, but he was blonde and he had colored eyes. And because he came from the Byzantine lands, they called him al-Rumi because he had a thick accent as well. So this is the reason why they call him al-Rumi, the Byzantine, the, the, the Roman. So Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu anhu, at this point now it's known that he has become a Muslim. So he faces the same persecution and torture as Bilal radiallahu anhu, Khabbab, and the family of Yasir radiallahu anhu. All of these great companions that underwent great sacrifices, they faced great struggles. So he, he starts to face the same persecution. Now the time comes to migrate to Medina, Munawwara. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam migrates Suhaib is looking for an opportunity to migrate. However, the Quraysh, they get wind of this news that Suhaib wants to migrate and they trap him. So he's unable to migrate. One day he makes an excuse that he's suffering from a stomach illness and he needs to go outside frequently to use the bathroom. And the soldiers that were watching over him fell asleep. While they fell asleep, he prepared a mount got a weapon together and he left. He leaves, when they wake up, they realize Suhaib has left. So they chase after him and eventually they catch up with him. When they catch up with him, Suhaib al-Rumi anhu climbs upon a hill and he looks down upon them and says, you know how good of a, an archer I am. I can kill all of you at this point and if my arrows run out, then I'll use my sword. What do you want from me? And they said, do you think that you who we gave space in our city and earned all that wealth, that we're going to let you leave just like that? Do you think that we're going to let you leave 
our town with all this wealth. So he said, is it the wealth that you want? Is it the wealth that you're after? He says, if it's the wealth I'm after, would you let me go? If I gave you everything that's in my possession, would you allow me to escape? Would you release me? They said, yes. He said, okay. I can tell you exactly where the wealth is. And the narration mentions that he actually returns with them so he can point out to them where the wealth was. And the wealth was under a doorstep in his house. Now, Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu anhu eventually is able to escape. And he leaves Mecca and travels to Quba and he reaches Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sees him from a distance, he says to him, and this is a beautiful statement, he says to him, Ya Aba Yahya, Rabih al Ya Aba Yahya, Rabih al O father of Yahya, Yahya was his son. O father of Yahya, your transaction has been successful. Rabih al At hearing this, Suhaib Rumi radiallahu whose face is beaming with joy. Can you imagine this? It just takes me aback sometimes, I'm thinking about it. Imagine this, he left everything, all his wealth behind. All his, he's going empty handed. And that's the deal he makes with them. If I give you everything, will you leave me? And they said, yes. When he reaches Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to him, your transaction is profitable. It's successful. His face is beaming with joy. He's beaming with joy because he says, oh Rasulullah, he says this, nobody reached you before I did. Only Jibreel could have informed you of this. Alayhi salam. Imagine that, subhanAllah. Oh Rasulullah, nobody reached you before I did. After I left Mecca, I came first. I know nobody passed me by. Only Jibreel alayhi salam could have informed you of this. And then Allah reveals the verse. Imagine the verse of the Quran is revealed about you. <laughs> Subhanallah. The verse of the Quran is revealed about you. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْرِي نَفْسَهُ بْتِغَاءَ مَرْضَاتِ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ رَؤُوفٌ بِالْعِبَادِ And from the people are some who sell their souls to seek Allah's pleasure. They sell their entire life. They give it away in trade. They trade their entire existence for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَاللَّهُ رَؤُوفٌ بِالْعِبَادِ And Allah is compassionate with all of His servants. So this was a verse that was revealed about Suhaib ibn Sinan Rumi radiallahu anhu. Now Suhaib radiallahu anhu is beaming with joy, he's happy. He's able to spend the rest of the years with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa On one occasion somebody walks in and sees Salman al-Farsi, Suhaib al-Rumi, Bilal al-Habshi, the Ethiopian, the Persian, the Roman, the Byzantine, all sitting together and speaking, talking about Islam. And they disrespect them. So, oh, Aus and Khazraj, if they speak about Islam, it's okay, they're Arabs. And these people, they're not. And somebody came to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and informed him of that. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to the masjid instantly and he announced for the people to gather. And then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that being Arab is not from your lineage, it's from speaking the language. And these people are speaking the language of Arabic. This is what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Suhaib radiallahu anhu was honored so much that when Umar radiallahu anhu was martyred, what did Umar radiallahu anhu give the instruction? That when I, after me, six people should get together and appoint one amongst them as the Khalifa. He didn't appoint one himself. Umar radiallahu anhu didn't appoint the Khalifa. But during that period when there was no Khalifa, after he passes and before the next Khalif is appointed, he said, what did he say? Suhaib should lead you in Salah. 
Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu anhu. Imagine that. Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu anhu is leading all of... Leading the salah was a big honor. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was the only one who led the salah. And in his absence, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu led it when he was in his marad al-wafat, the, the death, when, when he was on his deathbed. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu led it. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, nobody ever led him in salah. Only one companion because of some uh, incident that occurred during one of the ghazawat. So Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu anhu leading all of the sahaba radiallahu anhu in prayer during that time, during the absence of a khalifa, is a huge honor for him to have achieved. And there's many more virtues of Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu anhu and things to learn about him. Uh, but I'm going to move on inshallah to another very important story which is the story of the conversion of Salman al or not conversion, you can say the story of Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu coming to Islam and also reaching Medina Munawwara. And his story is even more fascinating. Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu's story. It's a very fascinating story. So Heba Rumi radiallahu anhu's story is beautiful because of the, the end bit of his, you know, his dedication where he gave everything up for Allah's sake. It's such a huge lesson for us. It's such a huge lesson for us, subhanAllah. But Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu's story is amazing because it's a huge journey behind his coming to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa and what he went through just to reach Medina Munawwara, the journey. And it's very, you know, it's amazing because ulama always speak about the sacrifices and the trials on the journey to ilm and knowledge. And when you read the stories of people like Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu, then you see sacrifices for truth, to learn the truth, to discover the truth. So Salman al-Farsi, from the name al-Farsi, as you can tell, was Persian. He belongs to a family of fire worshippers, Majus. His father was actually the one who would light the fire and maintain the fire in the temple. It was his duty to ensure that the fire never extinguishes. One day he was caught up with his work, so he wasn't able to attend to it as he would like. So he sends his son Salman, who up until now was sheltered. He was very, very protective and possessive over Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anh. So up until now, Salman al-Farsi was not exposed to many things outside of the home. But on this one occasion where his father sends him out, he happens to walk past a church and he hears the people worshipping. So he enters the church and he likes what he sees. He likes the worship. He sees them in prayer. And this story gives me evidence that Christians also prayed, traditional, proper Christians prayed like Muslims pray. Sajda. Isa alayhi salam made sajda. Musa alayhi salam made sajda. They all made sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's no doubt about that. So he sees them pray. He starts learning from them to the point that he's delayed and he returns home late without fulfilling the task that his father had assigned him. So he returns home late and his father questions him. He informs his father what delayed him. His father scolds him, rebukes him, discourages him from ever attending the gathering of Christians again and he chains him. So he's not allowed to leave. He sends a note and a message to the church saying that if any group is traveling from the land of Syria, Sham, which was known as Palestine, and, and all of those, Bilad al-Sham, Palestine, Lubnan, Urdun, all of those were known as Bilad al-Sham. If anybody is traveling from there, let me know. So a group was traveling from Sham, and they had visited this church, and they sent message for Salman al-Farsi. This group has arrived. He said, when they've completed their mission here, and they're about to return, let me know. So this happens. He's informed that they're about to leave, they're about to, about to depart. He somehow releases himself from the shackles and he reaches this caravan, this group of people that are traveling back to the lands of Sham. He goes with them. He goes with them until they reach a specific town. He asks them, who is the most learned person that I can, who's the best person that I can accompany and I can stay with so I can learn from? So they inform him about a certain monk. You go 
and stay in his com company, learn from him. He says, I went to this man and I stayed in his company, but I didn't like what I saw. He would tell the people to donate, but he would keep the money and he wouldn't give it to the masakeen, the destitutes and the children. To the point that he gathered seven large jars of coins and gold and silver. And I despised him for that. When he died, the people were mourning his death. And I said to them, why are you mourning his death? He was a thief. He stole all your wealth. And if you don't believe me, go to his house and you'll find the treasures there. And he pointed them to the treasures. They went and discovered that this man stole from them. They said, he's not worthy of burial. We're going to crucify him. So they hung him on a cross and they uh, stoned him. Then he asked the community, where should I go? Actually, no. What happens in the story is this monk is now replaced by another monk. He says that this individual was very righteous, very pious. He was selfless. He lived in this world, renouncing it, the worldly pleasures and desires. And I loved his companionship. I love staying in his company. One thing you're going to notice about Salman al-Farsi story, which I loved, what I saw a constant theme was his desire to stay in the company of righteous people. That's something that I really noticed in his story. Like it's not something that people highlight much, but if you look at Salman al-Farsi on his journey, he goes from one monk, stays with another monk, to another, to another, to another. Few. It's about five, six in the whole story. He stays with one for a few years. He lived for a very long time. He had a very lengthy life. He stays with one monk, and when this one's about to die, the second one, he says to him, who should I go to and stay with so I can continue my journey and my learning? Is there anybody like you on the same faith as you? So on and so forth. They say. So he points him to another land. Go and travel to such and such place, and you will find this monk there. Go, in, go to his company and stay, spend time with him. So he goes to that land, spends time with that monk, and they spend a significant amount of time until that monk also passes. Before his passing away, Salman al-Farsi asks him, where should I go to learn? And he says, nobody's on the truth anymore except this one man. He follows my path, go there. So he goes there. Same thing happens two, three times until the final one says, your time has now met the time of the final messenger. Now, I can't tell you to go to any monk or any individual. The final messenger has arrived. His time has come. And then he gives him some signs. First, he tells him that he will come from such and such a land. And he gives him some markers, some indications. And he's pointing to the boulders that are around Medina Munawwara. You know, when you travel to Medina and you see the, the black rocks... Right, those rocks and Medina is kind of between those mountains. So he says he's going to migrate to that land. So Salman al-Farsi is looking for a group of people that are from the Arabian lands. Eventually he finds a caravan, but they deceive him. And they sell him, they, enforce him into, they force him into slavery and they sell him. And it happened so that they sold him to a Jewish man who had a cousin that came from Medina to purchase him. Or came to visit his cousin and purchased him and took him back to Medina. As soon as he sees the land of Medina, he realizes where he is. Now he realizes the signs that were given to him. He sees the date palm trees, he sees the rocks, the boulders, and he realizes where he is. But some time passed. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had not arrived in Medina yet. So a few years passed. He doesn't hear about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while he was in Mecca because he was occupied with serving his masters and being in the fields all day. But when Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam migrates to Medina, this slave master, his master, has another cousin who visits him and says, May Allah destroy the people of Qayla. Now Qayla was who? She was the, the mother of Aus and Khazraj. The two major tribes, Aus and Khazraj of Medina, Aus and Khazraj were two individuals. Their mother was Qayla. Right, so the tribes 
of Aws al Khazraj, the, the leader was Sa'ad bin Mu'adh, Sa'ad bin Ubadah, but they're named after two historical individuals, Aws al Khazraj, their mother was Qayla. So this Jewish man is saying, May Allah destroy the people of Qayla, they're entertaining a man who's claiming to be a prophet. He's visiting. He says, When I heard this, I was at the top of a tree picking dates, doing things for my master. But suddenly I was taken over by a type of trembling in my body and I was close to falling. So I had to come down the tree. And I went up to that man and I said, what did you just say? What did you just say? Can you repeat yourself? And my master punched me on my face. He, said, he hits me. He says, go back to your work. What are you doing? He says, I just wanted to confirm what he was saying. I just wanted to confirm what he was saying. Now, the monk said to him, there are some signs. What are those signs? Not only does he indicate and point out what Medina looks like and what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's place of abode will be, but he also gives him other signs. He says, this prophet does not consume sadaqah, number one, charity. If you give him charity, he will not keep it for himself. Number two, if you give him a hadiyah and a gift, he will keep it. He will take gifts. He will accept gifts. And number three, on his back is the seal of prophethood. The mark of prophethood. Khatamun Nabuwa. So Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu hears that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is in Quba. So this is Quba. We're talking about Quba. This is when he arrives. And he comes to visit the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, I had a few items. I didn't have much. But some things I had gathered, I took it with me. And I, said, I entered and I said, this is for you as sadaqah. So Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took it and he asked a few of the people to consume it. Distribute it amongst yourselves. He never consumed it. He said, this is sign number one. He says, after a few days, I was able to gather some more items. By this time, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has uh, arrived in Medina. How long did he stay in Quba, by the way? Does anybody remember? 14 days. Okay, so 14 days, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stays in Quba. So now he arrives in Medina, he arrives in Medina, Masjid Nabawi, and goes to visit Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he says, I've brought you hadiyah, gift. So he gives Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the hadiyah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam takes the hadiyah, accepts it, and also consumes it. So this is sign number two. Then on one occasion, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in Baqir. Baqir is the graveyard. Immediately outside Masjid Nabawi. And while Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is standing with two pieces of cloth on him, he says, Salman al-Farsi says, I'm behind him looking. I'm looking for the sign. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi realizes, he knows what's going on. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself just removes his cloth. And I see the seal of prophethood. I was taken aback. I couldn't control myself. And I cried. And I grabbed him. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, turn around, come here, come here. And he says to him, then he says, what happened? Tell me what's, what's going on. So he gives him the entire story of how he ends up in Medina Munawwara and all of these signs. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was really happy. He said he wanted the companions to hear this story. He wanted the companions to hear the story. Now what happens a few years later, Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu, he's still, he's still under the, um, the possession of his master his, and he's still a slave so he Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him buy your freedom pay for your freedom release yourself he said oh Rasulullah I have nothing what am I going to give to free myself Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says go make a deal with him that you'll give him 300 date palm trees and that you will give him 40 and he, there's a weight called uqiyah which is a significant weight, 40 uqiyah of gold. So, how am I going to get this? He said, you just go and make the deal. So he speaks to his his slave master and they make the deal that this is what the deal is. They settle on that amount. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam announces to the Sahaba, bring date palm trees, small ones. 
So somebody brings 30, somebody brings 20, somebody brings 10, somebody brings 5. The whole community is helping him free himself. That is a beautiful sign of community and brotherhood. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. So everybody's helping him, bringing him trees. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says to him, now identify the space and dig small, small potholes, but don't plant them. I will come and plant them. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself goes and plants the trees. And Salman al-Farsi says, by Allah, not even one of them was a failure. Every single one of the trees were a success. Then it happened so that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received some wealth from one of the spoils of of Ghazawa, of war. And he calls Salman and says, here's some gold, take it and free yourself. Salman says, oh Rasulullah, it doesn't look like it's enough. He says, just wait and see. He says, but Allah, I weighed it and it was 40 uqiyah of gold. And I took it and I freed myself. He says, after that, there were no Ghazawat or expeditions or journeys that I had missed with Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu Was significant in the battle of Khandaq Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu uh, His experience From Persia Aided the Muslims In the battle of the trenches The Khandaq That wasn't a practice of the Arabs To dig trenches To avert enemy danger But this was Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu's Mushawara His Opinion that Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sought from his companions And it shows Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's leadership skills And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam took the opinion of A newcomer to the community Because of his prior experience And he had a lot to give and a lot to contribute So these are stories of amazing individuals Like Salman al-Farsi, Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu anhu It gives us a lot of perspective It really does for individuals who Sacrifice so much for their Islam Whether it's people that are being tortured for their religion in different parts of the world Which we see Which we see people that are struggling We see we hear about the Uyghur Muslims We hear about the Rohingya Muslims We hear about the situation in Kashmir The situation in different parts where There's a Zulm and oppression from non-Muslims Palestine Right We hear about all of these situations and it also gives us a, an appreciation for the newcomers to Islam and the sacrifices that they face in growing in their deen, learning their deen and preserving their deen. And of course, even for people that are born Muslim, but they might be tortured or persecuted for their religion, even in these countries, or face Islamophobic behavior. Of course, we have to take lessons from the lives of the Sahaba. Look at the sacrifices they, they faced, encountered. They overcame them. They faced up to them because they had strong conviction, strong faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was their strong faith in Allah that pulled them through. We have to strengthen our faith. Uh, we can never waver or give up our faith for anything. There's nothing more valuable than La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Sahib so Rumi radiallahu anhu showed us what's the point of this wealth if a person doesn't have. Their faith doesn't have their community, doesn't have their masjid, doesn't have their... There's no point of all that wealth if they don't have faith. None of it is going to go anywhere with us after we pass. So these are some of the lessons that we learn from these amazing stories. Now we want to, inshallah, very briefly, I'm going to touch upon one more, one more thing. And one second, I'm going to... Now, one of the other beautiful things actually mentioned by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu was that um, once Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pointed to Salman al-Farsi and said that if, if faith is on the stars of Thuraya, Thuraya was a known star, if faith is on the star of Thuraya, then it's the people of Faris who are going to catch it first. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about the people of Persia and the contributions that they're going to make to knowledge of Islam And Imam Al-Qurtubi Rahmatullahi Alayhi Says based on that وَقَدْ وَقَعَ مَا قَالَهُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَيْسْمَ عَيَانًا 
He says, what Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said occurred and we saw it with our own eyes because what we find from the people of Persia and their contribution to hadith specifically, he says, nobody shares this virtue with them. Nobody shares this virtue with them. So when we speak about the scholars of hadith, when you speak about Central Asian scholars like your Bukharis and your Muslims and your Tirmidhis and Nasai and Ibn Majah and Abu Dawood and, and all of these amazing scholars that came from Ray, uh, Ibn Abi Hatim al-Razi, Abu Zur'a al-Razi, all of these great scholars of hadith that gave so many services to the science of hadith, they came from these places, this land, from the people of Salman al-Farsi radiallahu anhu. So that is there. And who else came from there? Abu Hanifa, Nu'man ibn Thabit. So that's a win for the Hanafis as well. MashaAllah. Okay. Now we move on to Ta'sisu Masjid al Quba. Now Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in Quba and he builds a masjid. Actually, you know what? We'll, we'll end here. We'll continue from here next week, inshaAllah. Now we're going to be speaking about the Quba. And is Quba the masjid of taqwa that Allah is speaking about in the Quran? In the Quran, Allah says, the masjid that is established on taqwa from the first day is better for you to pray in. Because some of the munafiqeen, they wanted to build masjid dirar. They split from the community, they wanted to build their own masjid. So what is masjid taqwa? Is it masjid nabawi or is it masjid quba? We're going to have that discussion next week, inshallah. Which is masjid taqwa that Allah is referring to in the Quran? And there's masjid taqwa in Brooklyn as well, mashallah. Do you know masjid taqwa in Brooklyn? Imam Siraj Wahaj's masjid. That's also an amazing masjid. Why? Because that area was infested with drugs and so many different things. Bad, bad things in that community before Masjid Taqwa came. And Imam Siraj cleaned that area up. Alhamdulillah. The Muslim community in Brooklyn. So that's Masjid Taqwa as well. Alhamdulillah. And then we have Darul Taqwa too, mashallah. So, so the first thing Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam does in Quba is he... Uh, builds Masjid Quba. So we're going to learn about that, inshallah. Masjid Quba, the first Jumu'ah Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam participates in, and then we'll learn about his arrival in Medina Munawwara and the place that he chooses to settle in and how that happens, inshallah. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, wa nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, birahmatika ya rahmin.